Kia ora, g'day and welcome to the history of Aotearoa New Zealand, episode 22, Bob, part 1, the man, the myth, the legend. This podcast is supported by our amazing patrons, such as Cheryl and Vithya Bjorn, which I hope I've pronounced right, but I do apologise if I didn't. If you want to support Hans, go to patreon.com slash history Aotearoa. Last time, we talked about how to process harakeke, New Zealand flax, from the leaves of the plant into muka fibre that can then be woven into clothes and other useful items. I did say we would talk about these this week, but I have something slightly different and very exciting for this episode. I recently recorded a collaboration with the awesome Caden of the fantastic Happy Hour History Podcast about a part of New Zealand history that I've been dying to tell since I started Hans. It is one of my favourite stories from our history that you've probably never heard of. I wanted this to be about a single thing, but upon research, I couldn't help but expand it out to include the life and backstory of the key figure of this particular thing. As such, this will be in two parts, as you probably guessed from the title. Part 2 will be available on the Hans feed in a week or two, but it will appear on the Happy Hour History podcast feed earlier than that. So if you like this episode and want to hear the rest of it ASAP, then head over to Happy Hour History for Part 2. And while you're there, give the rest of the episodes a look as well, as it is a great comedy history podcast, introducing non-history fans into some of the best stories from our past, and I really can't recommend it highly enough. Now, I do have a bit of a warning. This will not be like a regular episode, as it is in the happy hour format, if you will. What this means is that this is an informal chat between me and Caden, with me teaching her about my topic. And as the name implies, she was having a couple of drinks. I myself had more than a few, and got, shall we say, pretty smashed. As such, there is heavy swearing, mostly from me, which I understand many of you may be uncomfortable with, or may not want to listen with your kids for that reason. That is fine, and it is totally understandable, but just giving you a heads up. The tale is also set out of the timeline, being set in the early 20th century. So there is that as well, if you don't wish to listen to a topic that is not based in our current pre-European Māori period. We will return to this topic when we get to it in the chronology, whenever that may be, so don't worry about missing out completely. With those warnings in place, as Caden would say, Sorry mum, I know you would be ashamed of my foul language. Strap yourselves in, ladies and gents, for the story of Bob Semple, or as I like to call him, Bobby Big Nuts. Hi everyone, it is Caden from Happy Hour History. Um, if you listened to my last episode, you will have heard that I had a guest host on, uh, Cameron, who taught me all about Operation Dragoon, and it meant that I got to sort of be um, in the hot seat for once, being the one learning about a topic. Well, I enjoyed doing that so much that I decided to um, invite another guest host on to teach me about another topic that I genuinely did not know about. This week we have an episode of the podcast which is being guest hosted by Thomas, who runs his own podcast called, and I'm going to mispronounce this, uh, The History of Aotearoa New Zealand Podcast. Um, and he has kind of very generously decided to come on uh, to have probably far too much to drink on both of our parts and to teach me about a really interesting gentleman. Uh, we learned about uh, Robert Semple and it was uh, very enlightening. So this episode is actually two parts. The first part of this two-part series is about Semple's early years and how he becomes involved in politics. Um, the next part is about 
um, something totally different really. It's about his war, uh, role in the Second World War. Um, I won't spoil what that is. In fact, I did not know at all what I would be learning about when I set off into this topic with Thomas, but it was a lot of fun to record, um, so hopefully you enjoy it. There will be a bit of intro in the episode itself where we both introduce ourselves because um, it is going to be cross-posted on both my page and his own, so we're just letting people know how they can find us. But hopefully you enjoy, and as always, sorry mom! My name is Thomas and I am the host of the History of Aotearoa New Zealand podcast. Uh, so we talk about uh, what you might expect is the history of Aotearoa New Zealand. So it's a chronological history podcast uh, going from before uh, when people arrived in New Zealand to probably 2000 or something. We haven't got that far yet. Uh, but basically, we talk all about New Zealand history, um, and at the moment, we are currently in the pre-European period, so before Europeans have even arrived, um, and uh, Tangata Whenua, which is Māori, the indigenous population of New Zealand, um, is currently hanging about um, on New Zealand and doing whatever they're doing, and so we're talking about that kind of stuff, specifically uh, their uh, kind of culture. So at the moment, at least at time of recording, uh, we have talked about the uh, the social structure of uh, Māori, and we've also talked about um, Māori carving. And at the moment, we are about to launch into another uh, set of episodes all about Māori weaving, um, and then after that, um, we're going to talk about all sorts of other things like medicine, tamoko, which is the uh, traditional Māori tattooing, um, as well as uh, warfare, so that includes the haka as well, which a lot of people might be uh, familiar with, um, and whatever else I can find. So that is who I am, um, and I'm also here with someone else uh, for once, um, instead of it just being me sitting here, <laughs> or at least if you're listening to this on my feed, um, normally it's me talking to a microphone talking to you, but I have someone else here probably for the first time ever. So yes. who are you? Yes, um, I'm Caden. Um, I run the Happy Hour History Podcast. Um, it is a show where we basically take one person, generally me, who has researched a topic on kind of whatever I think the other person would like, and we have rotating guest hosts that come in and we have a drink together. Um, I teach them a history lesson, um, hopefully convert them into somebody who really enjoys history. Um, I try to pick something, like I said, that I think would interest them the most to kind of sway them to our side. Um, the great thing about this format of a history podcast, though, is that every now and then I get somebody much smarter than me in a topic that I know nothing about, and I get to uh, bring them on my show, and um, they teach me something. So I get to be the person who's learning something for once, and today that's exactly what's happening. Uh, we're doing this collaboration because, turns out, I don't know anything about New Zealand. Um, so we are going to be doing a story that I genuinely have um, kind of no real understanding of. I don't, actually, we don't even, we haven't talked about what it's going to be, so I'm still totally I in the dark. I kept the very secret. <laughs> Um, and so I'm really excited because I, uh, for once, get to be sort of in the other seat, as it were. Um, so depending on which of our platforms you're listening to this on, you can follow um, the other one and get the rest of our content um, if you enjoy this episode. And if you hate this episode, you never have to do that. So, Yeah, that, that <laughs> might be interesting. I typically don't swear on my own podcast. So um, if you are coming from my feed, welcome. Um, I'm going to say fuck a lot. Yeah. So, you know, that's, yeah, my, um, that's uh, a thing. My, <laughs> my, my podcast is um, not safe for work. 
it generally includes lots of swearing. We don't really hold back because we're having a drink, so we're being sort of silly and a bit comedic as well. I always apologize to my mother for the swearing, so as usual, sorry mom, you're probably not even yeah. listening. All right, well, why don't we get into it? What are you teaching me about today? What am I teaching you about? So we are going to be talking about Bobby Big Nuts Simple, uh, which is what I call him. Get, keep keep your drink in your mouth. I you guys can't see this, but she nearly basically I, spit out. I shouldn't drink. I shouldn't have been taking a drink at that moment, but mm. you know what? Everything's fine. It, it all stayed where it needed to be. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that is the nickname I kind of call him, but his actual name is Robert Semple, um, who is a extremely important figure in the uh, early twentieth century in New Zealand, but. 95% of people haven't heard of him. The only sort of people that are going to know who he is are people that are really interested in New Zealand history or people who have been on the subreddit history memes uh, because <laughs> he is on there a lot. Before we get to the thing that he talked about, I want to give a bit of background on who he was and kind of what he did because he is extremely important, not just because of this dumb thing that he made, but also uh, in the early... Uh, 20th century in New Zealand history. He's arguably the most important man uh, in early 20th century um, New Zealand that you've never heard of. Um, so, uh, Robert Semple, or uh, we're just going to call him Semple from now on because I'm not going to say his full name the whole time. Um, so he was born in 1873 uh, in New South Wales uh, in Australia. So he's actually not a Kiwi. He's a fucking <laughs> Aussie. Um which, depending on which side of the fence you sit on by the time this episode or the, these episodes end, uh, is a good or a bad thing, right? <laughs> because it, in the classic fashion, we are able to slog our bad shit onto Australia. Um, so when Russell Crowe is doing really badly, no, he's an Aussie. But if he's really good, yeah, he's a Kiwi, you know? <laughs> so so we've got that thing still going. That's but he what was we born do with Justin Bieber. <laughs> like Amer America sucks, but Justin Bieber will always be Canadian. Exactly. Sorry, Justin. I know you're listening, Justin, and I am sorry. Yeah, we know Justin is listening. Uh, we know he's he's a notoriously big history fan, <laughs> um, so we obviously he is listening. Honestly, so, sorry to Russell Crowe too. Russell Crowe, and I love Russell Crowe. <laughs> I, I love Russell Crowe. I had a lot of people who were like, oh. Les Mis, the worst part of that film was Russell Crowe. If I'm honest, and, well, spoilers, but as soon as Russell Crowe died, I was not interested in the film. Like, he was what kept me going through that film. Like, yeah, no, I just <laughs> couldn't, couldn't deal with it after that. I was like, well, I've got no reason to watch anymore. Why am I watching this if Russell Crowe isn't doing his great singing? But people who actually knew stuff about singing were like, nah, he was shit. <laughs> So, yeah, so he was born in 1873 in Australia, um, outside the small mining town of Sofala, uh, which if you hadn't heard of that, um, yes, you probably haven't, because it's about uh, 3.5 hours drive northwest of Sydney, modern day Sydney. So it's a basically bumfuck town in the middle of nowhere. And he went to primary school um, until about age nine, uh, which is when he started working in the coal mines. Um, and he worked through a number of mines throughout his teen years um, and eventually moved to Victoria, uh, which is um, Melbourne, basically, or the capital was Melbourne, uh, to work in the lignite mines. Uh, and lignite, for those of you who are not versed in the, the coal mining world, is basically the lowest rank of coal. Uh, it is brown coal made from compressed peat. Are you um, well versed in the coal mining world? No, I googled that and then sure. looked on the Wikipedia page and then that's what it said. Okay, um, but I, just, I was just curious. I just, knew, I just knew that someone would be like, what the fuck is a lignite mine? So I was like, I better, I better make sure I know what that as is. As soon as you said anything about like people who don't know things, I'm just sitting here like, that is me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm glad I'm glad I wasn't alone on that, actually. Yeah, no, I didn't, I didn't know what a lignite mine either. <laughs> I was just like, I know, lignite sounds like something like you'd you blow up, right? Like you light it, like it sounds like dynamite, right? You'd light it on fire and it's, <clears throat> no, I don't know. It's just shit. So coal. I was like, oh, it's it's coal. It's um, it's brown coal. It's shitty coal, <laughs> basically. Um, so yeah. And then after a while, he got married to uh, Margaret McNair uh, in 1898 and began to get involved with the unions before eventually being drawn to Western Australia, which is Perth. 
uh, by the gold rush of the early 1890s. So this is going to become a theme. He is a big union guy. So this is where he starts getting into uh, those unions, and this is kind of where it all kind of kind of starts, essentially. So he stayed in Western Australia for a bit um, until he was forced to return to Victoria. Um, and the, the source said due to Margaret's illness, which makes it sound like the, this is something that was ongoing, but I wasn't able to find what that actual illness was. So <laughs> Just, you know, know. The, the illness. The illness. Yeah, the, the sick. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so she got sick, um, and so they had to return back um, to Victoria, which was in a town called Corimbora. I think I pronounced that right. Um, sorry, anyone from Corimbora that is listening. Um, that's also a bumfuck town in the middle of nowhere. Uh, you know that about, that's where all my listeners come from. All just, of your listeners. That's just that from. one spot. Yeah. <laughs> so that town's about uh, 1.5 hours drive southeast of Melbourne for anyone who actually cares about that sort of stuff. And very, very quickly, he became president of the local branch of the Victoria Coal Miners Association, um, which actually involved uh, being part of a lengthy, bitter, and violent industrial uh, dispute. So I didn't look too much into that, so I don't know what that is, but basically it, got, it, it went tits up real fucking fast. Um, and due to this, he was blacklisted um, from working in the industry. Um, so he couldn't actually find work anywhere else uh everyone knew who he was and basically said fuck you i know who you are uh go away uh so eventually he left for aotearoa new zealand um under a fake name uh in 1903 or 1904 we're not quite sure um so he's got off to a real good start of just just do, getting blacklisted wait then... do we know the fake name is that relevant no, I didn't. I couldn't find that either. I did look. Okay, for it, but okay, make, make, I couldn't find it. make it up. Best fake name. Ready, go. Uh, best fake name. I mean, Bobby Big Nuts is there probably go. a good fake name. There you go, Bobby Big Nuts. That's Bobby that's Big the fake Nuts. name. He does have big nuts. He um, wants to. He's just trying to start a new life. Be sweet. He to is Bobby trying to start a new life <laughs> by doing the classic thing that Aussies do: just fucking off to New Zealand. <laughs> So, you know, so he ends up uh, leaving Australia um, because Aussies suck um, and coming to New Zealand. And he ended up working um, in a newly opened coal mine in Runanga, uh, which if you don't know where Runanga is, um, that's fine. Neither did I before this. Uh, Runanga is five minutes north drive of Greymouth. <laughs> Do you know where Greymouth is? <laughs> that, that has no meaning to me, <laughs> but I believe you. Yeah, so Greymouth, um, all the all the all the Kiwi listeners will be going, yeah, I know, I know where Greymouth is. Don't <laughs> worry. Uh, but Greymouth, um, for anyone who doesn't know, is on the uh, west coast of the South Island in New Zealand. Okay. So it's very rural uh, and it's very well known for its mining towns, Greymouth included. Um, Greymouth, for anyone else who's listening, um, is where the Pike River mine uh, disaster happened. Um, we're not going to talk about that, but for anyone who kind of knows what that is, that's where that happened. Um, so, at this point, uh, he was said to have a, quote, dashing figure, high prominent cheekbones, a drooping moustache that accentuated sunken cheeks, and sparseness of build that, uh, sparseness of build gave the impression of a tall, angry young man, end quote. And I'm Can not going to leave you with... Bef- I, don't, I don't mean to interrupt, but I am going to interrupt. Yep. Do you, you don't know... mean to interrupt. That is the that's the whole thing. That's you know? true. That's the point. Um, can you tell me where does that quote come from? I have absolutely no idea. Okay, I love it. I was actually wondering more because um, shout out to another history podcast, a comedy history podcast. In fact, um, I was listening to a show called Hysterical History recently, and they were remarking on the fact that women are always described with how they look, which doesn't frequently happen to men. So I just love oh. that they, they went really hard into his looks, and I was just into it. Yeah, that's interesting, actually. You're right, though. Yeah, people, the women generally get, um, yeah, talked about in their looks. But you understand why this guy got talked about because of his looks? Because I've actually got a couple of pictures of what his, he looked his like. drooping uh, mustache. So I've got a couple know. of pictures. So the first picture is of him. And the second picture, he's sitting uh, second from, uh, sorry, third from the right, 
Um, so right in the middle in the front oh, row. Oh, right in the middle. Look, that is a mustache. Ooh. He is a very good looking man. Um, Ooh. If I'm honest, if there was someone I was going to turn gay for, first it would be Hugh Jackman, second it would be <laughs> this guy. Oh, guys, I need... I'm going to have to post these pictures to my social media. So if you follow me on Happy Hour History Pod on social media platforms, except Twitter, which is Happy History Pod. Um, this guy's eyes, they stare right into your soul. They do. Like, yeah, so like I'll he... put them on, the, um, on my website as well. Um, for anyone who's uh, listening on my end, you know where the website is, historyaltero.com. Uh, they'll be under this episode as well. I've got a few more pictures as well. So any pictures I mention, um, you'll be able to see them there as well. But he's a good-looking man. He um, he knows my secrets, and yeah. that frightens me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, he's um, <laughs> yeah, they do. Yeah, I I didn't actually think about that steering into my soul, but they do a bit, don't they? Um, yeah, no. So he's um he's a very good-looking man, and you can tell why he um, you know, he was quite highly regarded for his looks. But interestingly enough, three months after his arrival in New Zealand, he was made the inaugural president of the Coal Creek State Mines, uh, sorry, Coal Creek State Mines Union. Um, so he's he, he turns up, basically does he basically what he ends up doing is like a Napoleon turns up and goes, "Hey fellas, <laughs> it's me. I'm a cool dude," and they just they just make him president like immediately. I mean, so, considering the last country like basically blacklisted him, the new name thing was a perfect idea. It worked swimmingly so far. Exactly. So he's doing pretty well for himself. However, after a few months, um, uh, a few months after he gets made president of this association or this union, uh, mining work in his town of Runanga uh, dries up, and he went to work as a tunneler um, on a railway for about a year. Which is pretty nasty work. Um, although working in a coal mine is also nasty work. Yeah, so eventually I can't decide he comes if back... that's better or worse. Probably better because you know there's there's not the lung disease. Um, Fair. So is that good point? Um, so he comes back to Runanga after that, um, and he registers with the Court of Arbitration, uh, a court set up to deal with industrial pros- uh, disputes. Uh, so this is something that is going to come up again and again throughout his uh his story so i have written a bit of stuff about what this this actually is uh because it's it's mildly important to know what this actually is and why he hated it so much um because he did actually say um or he would he would later condemn this as an instrument of state oppression so he's pretty firmly against this body and this um particular act as it turns out so the Industrial Conciliation and Arbitration Act of 1894 uh, meant that unions had to register and had the exclusive right to represent all their members in a particular job or industry. So it's basically setting up um, a method of how unions can deal with their employers um, in a safe and you know good manner, essentially. So it made it compulsory for employers to negotiate with these unions over disputes. So the employers... Um, you know, they had to recognize unions and they had to deal with them. Um, that sounds good, I think. Yeah, so that's, that's pretty good in general. Uh, so first it would be heard by a local board, and then if no agreement was reached, it would be taken to that national arbitration court, um, which would make a decision that both sides were legally bound to accept, right? So whatever that court decided, they had to agree to. You had no choice. Okay, interesting. So that's, yeah, so that is interesting. So the court also had power to set wages, and this gradually ended up setting minimum wages and working conditions for certain groups, generally meaning that those, uh, you know, wages tended to increase and working conditions, working conditions tended to get better. Fucking great. That's awesome. <laughs> so this all sounds pretty Jim Dandy, right? The concession was, though, that strikes by workers or lockouts by employers were illegal when a dispute was being negotiated, and once an agreement had been uh, and once an agreement had been settled, so you know you couldn't you could as a worker you couldn't strike, and as an employer you couldn't lock your um, your, your employees out um, to stop them working and thus getting paid. Um, so that was kind of the concession that you made for the system, and so this. Uh, this act was actually the the first in the world of its kind. 
um, people from the US, France, Britain, and Russia, as well as others, actually came to New Zealand to study the, quote, country without strikes, end quote. Uh, and this act and system would remain until actually the 1970s. So it's it's a really big fucking thing in <laughs> New Zealand history, again, that you've probably never heard of. No, I certainly hadn't heard of it, but that's fantastic. Yeah, so generally, it sounds like a pretty good idea. It, it sounds like it initially... could go wrong, and I'm thinking yeah, that might well, be where you're leading it, us. It does go wrong. <laughs> so initially, Too good to be true. Successful. There were lots of new unions, and wages and conditions, as I said, generally improved, but there were cracks that started to appear uh, within the first sort of 10 years or so. Uh, the larger and more powerful unions didn't like being strangled by the lack of ability to strike. Um, as it is an extremely powerful tool in their kit, right? So if you're a big union, a national union, your ability to make thousands of workers stop working is a hugely impressive tool. You get that That's really, really good to negotiate. If you're a small kind of local union, not so much. It doesn't really matter. But for those big unions, striking is a great tool. And this act basically relinquished that tool. So they were pretty pissed off about that. And on the other side, the employers didn't like leaving decisions of wages and working conditions to judges and then being legally bound to uphold them um, instead of just lying, relying on the free hand of the market. Um, so they were essentially handing over power to someone else that they have no idea who they are or what their motivations are or anything like that and being told that they have to, you know, they have to... Uh, you know, they're legally bound to accept the decision. They weren't really happy about that because the, the judge could go, yeah, sweet ass, everyone gets 50 bucks an hour. And they're like, fucking what? <laughs> like, <laughs> Excuse me? Excuse me? So, yeah, so they weren't really happy about handing over that power rather than being like trying to pay them, paying, uh, paying workers kind of what they're worth um, deemed by, you know, the market, essentially. So from about 1902, the arbitration court was bogged down with so many cases, it could take a year before you would actually be heard. So that kind of was another kind of nail in the coffin. you can't strike that whole time while you're waiting, I assume? Exactly. Ah, so you can't fucked. strike, you can't lock out your, uh, your workers, you can't do fuck all, because, yeah, because that was, that was the law, right? Ah, the so, beauty of bureaucracy. Exactly. So... So that, you know, increasing dissatisfaction um, saw, saw a strike occur 12 years after the act was passed. Uh, two tramway, wind stop, tramway men stopped working for three hours after two members of the union were fired. Uh, so that was the first kind of actual strike that happened after this law was passed. And that strike was successful. The men who were fired did get their jobs back. But this did lead to more strikes, and it did show the unions that striking was still the best way to get results. It, it really kind of devolved, right? You know, that once they, once they, someone actually decided to strike, even if it was a small strike like this one, it did show that this was the best way to do it. So yeah, at that point, it's sort of like if this works, if it ain't broke, exactly. no point in fixing it. <laughs> Exactly. So it kind of justified those big unions, right? Those big unions were saying, I'm not really comfortable with relinquishing my ability to to strike. And then these two, like, just, just, just two random dudes just went on strike and then got what they wanted. <laughs> so the big unions were kind of like, well, if these two dudes can get what they want, we've got thousands of dudes that can just strike. So, you know, like, obviously that's the best way to do it. So that's kind of the background of of what this arbitration court was. So he was, uh, Bob Semple was, or Robert Semple was very, very against this. Um, so eventually, uh, the Runanga Union community uh, started to get bigger and more organized, and they actually got more radical as well. So a miners' hall was opened, and they had words on the walls uh, that said, United we, united we stand, divided we fall, the world is my country, to do good is my religion, not for a race, but for all of mankind, world's wealth, for world's workers. Okay. So, so if you haven't picked up by now, uh, Bob Semple is a socialist. <laughs> uh, so he's, he's big into socialism, which is different to communism. For anyone listening who doesn't know the difference, I don't know the difference, but I do know there is a difference. <laughs> and 
we will see later down the line he's actually against communism um so socialism communism different thing but he's very much into unions and that kind of thing so the hope um for this was to make a series of national unions rather than local unions like the one he was president of um that would combine strength of all the working class um and this appealed to simple in his fiery passions so this is going to be something again that's going to keep coming up again and again so his idea was basically increasing uh the um yeah the power of the working class essentially regardless of who uh what industry you were in um which is a is a pretty noble sort of um sort of endeavor so throughout this he became known as bob the renter and fighting bob that was his nicknames uh not as good as uh, bobby big nuts i uh, must say <laughs> Um, and this was due to his tenacity, competitive spirit, flamboyant and passionate speaking, and his ability to bully and cajole. He was also a boxer, so there was that too. So that's where he got Fighting Bob from as well. He was, I, I hesitate to say, he was the Hitler of our um, of New Zealand in the sense that he was very good at speaking, but he does get a Hitler mustache later on in his life. So. Oh no, oh goodness. Yeah, okay, so basically... That. All we need to know is that if his eyes don't pierce you in a way that makes you want to do everything he asks, he can then use a silver tongue to make you actually believe anything he says. Yeah, exactly. So, oh. um, yeah. So I, I love him. To say, but, um, yeah, you know, he gets a Hitler mustache. He's very good at speaking. You know, all the signs are there, basically. So he used the victory of uh, the Black Bull Strike to show the workers that they could throw off the yoke of arbitration easier than they thought. Um, do you want to know about the Black Bull strike? Give, me, give it to me in like five sentences or less. Can five you do sentences. It? Can you do it? Maybe. I wrote a whole paragraph. <laughs> <laughs> you can do it in more. I just thought, how, how difficult could I make it for you? Uh, so Black Bull is a, is a town on the West Coast. Uh, basically, the gist of it was miners only got 15 minutes to eat their lunch. Um, and the manager wanted to increase the working day to 10 hours. Which, for those of you who aren't familiar with New Zealand working conditions today, um, as a person who lives and works in New Zealand, I am legally mandated uh, to work, um, or most places work uh, eight hours, but I'm legally mandated to have two 15-minute paid breaks and one half-hour unpaid break. Um, so to work 10 hours uh, was a big fuck you and uh, work 15 minutes, uh, sorry, eat lunch for 15 minutes was a big fuck you to these guys at the time. Uh, so the union decided to strike um, as, as both to challenge this and as well as a challenge to the arbitration system. Um, and basically it, it all kind of escalated from there um, and the, the strike ended up going for three months. Um, and eventually the mining company caved in and um, anyone who was fired during that time got their jobs back um, and the mining company agreed to their demands. And this was a huge, this was a big thing at the time because it was a huge blow to the arbitration system. So all that court of arbitration we're talking about before um, and this and the impact of this was actually felt across the country. Um, so this was a huge thing that we're not really going to talk about uh, because because <laughs> we're not interested in that. We're interested in Bob Semple. But he did, he did talk about this a bit, um, and this, this strike led him to go up and down the west coast of the South Island to drum up support for a regional industrial union. So bringing all labour into one organisation as a first step of getting rid of the arbitration system. So, yeah, so he's, he's wanting to bring everyone under the same umbrella as the hope. So this was somewhat ignored, uh, mostly by watersiders, which as far as I can tell, basically means dock workers. Sure. Um, so Simple and his Runanga union mates uh, went back to talk to the people that they knew, uh, which was the coal miners, because that was the industry that he was in. Um, so attempting to make a union just for miners, leading to the creation of the New Zealand Federation of Miners in 1908. So this also led to various mining officials pulling out of the arbitration system, convinced by, convinced by Semple and his speeches. So he was extremely effective at what he was doing. So yeah, so big, big, you know, he's already, um, so he was born in what, 1873, and it's 1908 now, so he's probably in his late 20s, early 30s, um, and he's already making waves uh, in the New Zealand labour movement. So he's doing very well for himself uh, when it comes to that. Um, so yeah, so he's um, already a big name. 
um, and hopefully uh, there's still people listening um, because I understand <laughs> that this might be a bit boring. So yeah, I figure like that could easily really glaze eyes. But to be honest, all I could think about was the photo of that man really convincingly speaking to people, and I was like, you know what? I believe it. That'd work. Yeah, you would. That's you what would. I thought at the time he could like, sell. Yeah, he could sell ice to an Eskimo. Exactly. Like, Honestly, because I'd be looking at that mustache going, oh, how does he keep that so groomed? Anyone like, who has that mustache, I'd be like, yeah, I instinctively trust you. Exactly. Not that, at this point, guys, I don't know if the Hitler mustache is a thing yet, but I haven't seen that photo. No. I've only seen the luscious mustache. I don't yeah, have... no, the Hitler mustache doesn't come for a wee while yet. I'll show you that a bit later on. Good, good. I, just, so I, don't, point... I don't want anyone to think I liked the Hitler mustache. That's yuck. <laughs> <laughs> It's not really that noticeable, to be honest. Um, but yeah, no, the big bussy mustache is, is definitely very nice. So Simple began using his confidence and bravado to expand the new organization to include transport workers. And eventually the watersiders were like, yeah, sure, yeah, we'll join. So for some reason they said, fuck you at the start. And now they're like, yeah, cool, we'll join. So this was uh, this organization after it expanded because it was called the, the New Zealand Federation of Miners. But if you've got other guys that aren't miners, you've got to rename it. So it was renamed to the New Zealand Federation of Labor. And collo- colloquially, it was known as the Red Feds um, because, you know, they were socialists. So red socialism, communism, that kind of stuff. So and St. Paul was made its organizer. So kind of the guy who you know, goes out and makes sure everyone's doing what they're doing. Kind of like a producer, but not really, (laughs) I guess. So in this role, he roamed the country advocating industrial unionism and made employers shit themselves uh, with threats of widespread industrial revolt. So he was was pulling out the fucking big guns uh, for this stuff, basically saying, if you don't fucking do what we want, uh, we're just going to... Everyone in the cross country is just going to fucking strike. And... Very few employers were prepared to call that bluff um, and, and, and actually attack Simple directly. Um, they were all just like, nah, I'm just like <laughs> giving into it, you know? Um, and in fact, what ended up happening, some unions that didn't have the resources or the will uh, to face their employers in the open um, actually would use sometimes Simple's name to get them to back down. So if the employer came along and said, look, your guy, you guys are going to work you know, 12 hours a day, they'd go, look, that's fine, but we'll get Simple down here and he'll give you a talking to. And the employees were like, fuck off, no way. I'm not doing that. Simple is like everyone's mom. Like, I'm going to tell mom on you. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Not if I tell mom. Pretty much. Pretty much. So he was actually, he actually ended up becoming uh, kind of a union boogeyman in the (laughs) eyes of industry leaders. Um, So he was, you know, again, he's probably in his early 30s at this point and he's making big names in industry absolutely fucking shit themselves just at the the thought of him coming down and giving them a talking to which is just just fantastic like that's amazing you know it's like that's the kind of power i want to have in my early 30s <laughs> is is to make people shit themselves important grown people shit. men tremble exactly so he's making waves and in, in industry as well as the unions as well. And the, the, the Federation uh, wasn't without its criticisms, though. It was, you know, a lot of people actually said, you know, that this isn't a good idea. And it actually mostly came from uh, Simple's own team, uh, as the more militant members of his ideology thought that the Federation had just replaced the arbitration system. Um, and so now it had become part of what you might call the man, right? And it lost its revolutionary potential due to its size. So basically that it got so big that the unions were joining this federation and because of there was all the bureaucracy and that kind of stuff, it, it wasn't actually doing what necessarily they set out for it to do. So, you know, it, it was just basically part of it. was just a replacement for that system. It was just a different, it was that system, but with a different face. Um, and Simple did find this hard to counter. Um, so they weren't necessarily... Uh, incorrect or unjustified in their um, in their attacks in this manner. So in 1912, there was a new prime minister by the name of W. F. Massey. Uh, and for anyone who's from New Zealand, from uh, who has recognised that name, yes, it is that Massey, the one that the university is ma- named after. 
Um, so Massey gave more power to employers in an attempt to drive back unions to the arbitration system. So Massey was a very well-known anti-unionist and conservative. He just fucking hated workers <laughs> for some reason. So the idea being he was just, yeah, putting more power into, the, uh, into employers so that they could drive them back to the governmental system. And to combat this, uh, Semple wanted to conduct, quote, united, dreadful, and short strikes, end quote, rather than engage in prolonged and extensive, expensive fights that they would be unlikely to win. Semple is very hot-headed, and he's a very passionate kind of revolutionary, but as I've noted here, uh, he didn't have the big dumb. Uh, he was a smart <laughs> guy. Uh, he knew what he was doing. Uh, he was... and. He was right, actually, to not go balls to the wall uh, with the government, um, as the government did fear his wilder outbursts might fuel an uncontrollable general strike amongst all workers in all industries, but especially the West Coast miners. And the interesting thing about this is that this did eventually happen in 1979, with 300,000 workers going on strike all across the country. So, again... Massey was not unfounded in his fears. Again, Semple is making waves uh, in this industry in sort of his probably mid-30s by now. I need to say, because I'm a child and I find this really funny, that their names are so indicative of them. Yeah. You've got one called Simple, who actually isn't that simple, I have to say, and one called <laughs> Messy. Yeah, sorry. It's about it's, to get Messy. S-E-M-P-L-E. And yeah. Messy, M-A-S-S-E-Y. Just to yeah. clarify anyone who's, who's, but, who's listening to this. But it's almost irrelevant. <laughs> it's, it's, almost <laughs> it's there. It's it's there and it's enough. He should have so, made, yeah, so, like, made that his like slogan. Like, it's about to get messy. Or like, clean the mess. Messy. <laughs> Actually, in fairness, I didn't look into messy that much. <laughs> so, you know, maybe. Maybe I mean, he did. I recognize that this man is dead, but... I mean, I think I could have been, like, a campaign worker for him. I could have been on that team. I don't like him. I don't think he's good in this story. But the yeah. it's the, the word the word play is just so... It's right there. It writes itself, doesn't it, really? <laughs> you know, it's it, you don't have to do much work. You know, he comes along and goes, look, I'm going to pay you all this fucking money to write all the slogan stuff. And I'm like, bro, it's in the name. It's already there. Don't worry about it. You know? I will take the money, though. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'll still take your money, thank you. But, um, yeah, that's five minutes worth of work. <laughs> so, due to kind of all this rhetoric that Semple is putting out and this kind of stuff, the police actually started monitoring Semple's movements very closely. And this resulted in him still remaining a key and colourful figure in the New Zealand labour movement, but just one that was a bit more cautious and a bit more aware of kind of what was going on and that kind of thing so in, in 1912 he did say that he would not trust the police quote with a diseased cat end quote and even said in regards to the death of fred evans and the why he strike who police claimed had, you know they the police claimed that fred evans had shot a cop that he was quote doing his duty and shot more of them end quote so i also have some information on the why he strike if you want to know that stuff um, but basically the gist of it is this strike got extremely, this was a big strike and got extremely violent, um, and ended up with Fred Evans being killed. And the police justified that by saying he was, uh, he killed, he, he shot a cop. Um, so Semple was very against cops. He was very against the state. Um, you know, again, quote, doing his duty and should have shot more of them, end quote, um, in regards to talking about police. Um, so this was extremely inflammatory rhetoric um you know he he is advocating essentially advocating for the killing of police um which you know depending on which side of the fence you sit on is not really a great idea um but despite this it was noted that he specifically did not advocate for a general strike so he was he knew what was going on he knew what was happening and he knew that if he started advocating for a general strike, the, the cops were probably going to grab him. Mm. So he specifically avoided it. So that's, again, kind of interesting in the sense that, yeah, he was hot-headed, yeah, he was flamboyant and that kind of stuff, but 
he was, you know, he wasn't stupid. He knew that the cops were looking out for him, so he didn't go out there being like, you should all just fucking strike. He's Fuck towing the, the line. Exactly. He's towing <laughs> the line without sort of going out there being like, fuck yeah, let's, you know, let, let's do all this shit. Because he's, he's like, no, otherwise I'm going to get arrested. <laughs> so, yeah. So then some more stuff happens, which is like not relevant. Um, and then that eventually results in the formation of the United Federation of Labour. And if you're listening to this and you're like, didn't we just talk about that? No, we didn't just talk about that. That was the U- New Zealand Federation of Labour. This is the United Federation of Labour. And you would be um, you'd be forgiven for thinking those are very similar <laughs> things, um, which is really fucking annoying. Uh, it took me a long time to get my head around. But basically, the United Federation of Labour, as far as I can tell, um, was a political party rather than a union, which is what the New Zealand Federation of Labour was. So the New Zealand Federation of Labour was a kind of union, whereas this one was a political party. They're just trying to trip you up. I know. It's, it's <laughs> so annoying. I actually put this out on Twitter saying, like, this is really annoying. And I had a couple of people come back being like, yeah, here's all these things that sound very similar in New Zealand politics. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> fucking hell. So... So I'm certainly not alone uh, in that regard. So this United Federation of Labour um, went up against the government directly. Uh, that resulted in Semple's arrest. Um, so he actually got arrested um, eventually. Uh, but he was released. Um, the, the, the sort of silver lining behind this, though, was that this ended up being... Uh, or the, the rest of the, the leadership of the United Federation of Labour basically got fucked. Um, and since he was locked up um, for a little bit, he avoided that. So he was one of the leaders of this United Federation of Labour. But because he was locked up, he could come out and be like, well, you know all that dodgy shit that people were doing? I was in prison during all that, so I couldn't have done that. (laughs) Good alibi. Exactly. So he's like, I couldn't have done that. So people were like, yeah, fair enough, he was in prison. I was Uh, with the government. So he became the organiser of the reconstructed uh, United Federation of Labour. So fucking good on him. Some pretty damn good luck uh, <laughs> in that regard. But of course, eventually, as I said, it was about 1912 uh, at this point. And of course, we are rolling around to uh, the infamous uh, Dub Dub One, which is World War One. <laughs> so in, 19, uh, in 1914, sorry. Uh, yeah, so war was cleared in 1914. Um, and Simple flourished uh, during that period as a propagandist. Um you know, kind of doing his flamboyance and his kind of, you know, hot-headedness and getting out there and, you know, rallying uh, the workers and that kind of stuff. So he really flourished uh, in that environment. And the thing was, he had long been a critic of compulsory military training. Uh, And in fact, he was even prosecuted in 1913 for failing to reveal his son's age to a defense officer, Um, which is, you know, not not good because he wants to know how old he is so he can conscript him. (laughs) <laughs> um, so, and he was again arrested uh, for that, actually, uh, and he refused to pay the four pound fine um, to be released. Uh, but thankfully, he obviously made an impression over the years with his Runanga uh, mates, um, and they actually paid for his release. Um, oh. They paid that fine. They pulled it all together um, and paid his fine. Um, so he'd obviously done pretty fucking well um, for himself Guys, and then. This is a impre- story of friendship. <laughs> This no idea. Of... I have no idea where it's going, but right now it's a story of friendship. It's a story of friendship. It's, <laughs> it's not about. It's not about where we end up. It's about the friends we make along the way. Exactly. <laughs> so yeah, so they pay for his release and he gets out. And during this time, he was also an outspoken critic of conscription, specifically as well, uh, when it was introduced. And he tried to get his union position um, and you basically use it to, you know, force or, you know, make the miners, uh, you know, strike and use their collective industrial strength uh, to combat the, um, the you know, the, the use of conscription. Um, and he even at this point, he decided, fuck you. He even hinted at a general strike in the coal fields. So the government naturally shit itself. The, the <laughs> government was extremely worried. Uh, By this because... point, he's sort of like, I've already done the jail thing at least twice, so fuck it. General strike. Let's do it. Exactly. He went in, and he goes, you know what? 
this is pretty easy. You know, I just slept in a cell for like a couple months. No worries. That's all good. I can do that again. So, yeah, so he was you know, advocating for a general strike and generally basically showing the government that they were willing to just not work if conscription was to go ahead. And the government was shit scared of this, uh, p- faced with a potential coal shortage if this were to occur. And this is a pretty big fucking problem at this time uh, in the best of circumstances because coal is, of course, the way that we get electricity. It's the way that we power basically everything at this point. And at the moment, there's a global war going on. So coal is extremely important and risking a coal shortage is something the government cannot do at this point. So it's, it's a pretty big thing, and it's a pretty big victory for, for Semple in general. So in 1913, Semple actually moves um, his family out of Runanga and to Wellington, which is the capital, uh, which is where I live. Um, so he moves to the capital, and by now he is a national figure. He is, you know, most people know who he is, um, again, because he's flamboyant. He's hot-headed. He does all these speeches. It's fucking amazing. He's a great <laughs> guy. He's advocating for the workers. It's fucking awesome. I imagine, I imagine he, like, comes into people's hometowns, and they're just so excited. Like, they have the pamphlets. They're ready. They're, like, lining the streets. They're like, we are so excited to see him. He's going to autograph it for me. <laughs> yeah, as far as I can tell, that's, you know, vaguely what happens, basically. <laughs> they're very excited when Simple comes to town. So he's a he's a big he's a big guy when it terms comes to you know this kind of stuff, and he was actually elected to Parliament as MP for uh, Wellington South, um, and this was actually a year after he was released from prison. <laughs> so people just didn't give a fuck that he was in prison like a year earlier. They're like, yeah, this is this is my guy. This is <laughs> this is who I want me to represent in government. Like he actually gets elected to Parliament, and eventually. He, he, he goes into politics uh, under the banner of the New Zealand Labour Party. And for anyone listening who is from New Zealand or familiar with New Zealand politics, this isn't quite the New Zealand Labour Party we see today. It was probably the United Labour Party, which was a predecessor of the modern Labour Party, which was formed in 1916. So this had partially been formed uh, with the aid and integration of the United Federation of Labour. So the United Federation of Labour was that... Uh, party that he was part of earlier and then some like other shit happened that was like really boring and irrelevant uh, and eventually became uh, this party so the united labor party the introduction of the refreshed labor party kind of rocked parliament's world a little bit um because you know this parliament this this, gov- uh, this sorry this party was coming into government with all these at least at the time quite radical ideas um you know with like unions and and you know equal pay for equal workers and all this shit. And they're like, whoa, bro, like, we don't want to be fucking, you know, giving all these equal rights and shit to all these people. <laughs> and they're like, well, maybe you should, because it's like... What Hold you the phone do. on equal rights. Are we really sure that this is what we want? <laughs> exactly. Which is a bit strange, because if you think about it at this point, New Zealand is already given uh, women the vote at this point in history. So New Zealand is quite ahead of its time. Uh, when it comes to um, just general, you know, equal rights and that sort of thing. Um, like, most of the world isn't going to give women's rights for another, at least yeah. until post-World War Two. So for at least for another, like, 30 or 40 years. So New Zealand is actually, at this point, quite well known for being, you know, ahead of its time, in a sense. Um, so it's a bit interesting that, yeah, you know, they're like, yeah, unions and workers' rights? Nah, fuck that, we're not about that. It's like, <laughs> women? Yes, sweet ass, no worries. It's like, hang on, like... You know, so it is It is a bit of a, a weird kind of dichotomy in a sense. But yeah, so it rocked Parliament's world. And in particular, the newest member who said that this uh, this party had, quote, not come to this house to perpetuate a class war or to create class division. The class war is already here in all its hideousness, end quote. So even from that quote, you can see you know, how good of a speaker this guy was, how good of a speaker Simple was. He is amazing. You know, he is great on the House floor. And he said that Labour's purpose uh, was to, quote, obliterate the class line, end quote, and to build a society, quote, on reasonable and democratic lines, end quote. So he is 
he's he's coming out of the fucking gate, you know, <laughs> absolutely just, just burning. When you think about it, this is a small town fucker from you know bumfuck middle of nowhere Australia, eventually moves to bumfuck middle of nowhere West Coast South Island, ends up in Parliament, saying shit like that, <laughs> like that's amazing, you know, like he's, <laughs> he's he's going up to fucking the prime minister and saying. You're doing a shit job. He would have trended on Twitter if it had been today. Absolutely. He, I mean, he's... He's... Oh. I don't know if you noticed, but I think this guy's amazing. I think he's <laughs> awesome. I am getting the vibe that you, you may feel have that way. Right I, I only slightly noticed. I was sort of on the fence about it. On the fence. Didn't want to say anything in case I was wrong. Yeah. <laughs> so the interesting thing about this as well is he actually represented an urban electorate. Um, so, you know, he represented Wellington South, which is an urban electorate. Um, and his key movements in Parliament actually were often for his rural working class communities that he was passionate about. So even though he'd moved to Wellington, he was actually elected, you know, to represent an urban area. He never forgot about those people that he'd left behind um that he'd left in you know those rural areas that were doing the hard graft when it came to the coal mines and that kind of stuff which that's like something that we shouldn't really overlook because so Mm. many people have this sort of beautiful kind of rise to power from like rags to riches and then they become total dicks exactly so they don't they don't remember where they started absolutely and that's what i kind of admire in Bob Semple is that, you know, he goes through this, all this hardship. He actually, you know, as I said, at age nine, he starts working in the coal mines and now he's, he's in parliament in New Zealand, you know, and he, he doesn't forget about his origins, about where he's come from, about the people that he's met along the way. You know, he's still advocating for them about, you know, he's still advocating for their rights. And you can argue that essentially, yeah, he should be, you know, advocating for his, the people that he, um, you know, elected him into power, you know, that Wellington South urban electorate. But personally, I think there's something to be said about his, you know, his willingness to advocate for people that technically didn't elect him, the people that, you know, essentially got him to where he is. You know, there's definitely something that is um, kind of romantic in a sense, (laughs) Um, but quite, you know, it's nice that he hasn't lost that kind of... um, yeah, you know, kind of sense of where he's from and who got him here. Which, as you say, is, um, you know, something that you see a lot, um, not just in politics, but, you know, there's, you know, you see that in lots of different industries when people come for celebrities and, and that kind of thing. So, yeah, so he defiantly uh, challenged um, a parliamentary opponent to, quote, live in the same shacks that the miners have to live, in. quote. Ooh, ooh that's, like a, that's like a mic drop. Like, yeah. throw, throw it on the gauntlet, you give it a go. You think you you yep. think that people can do this? Then why don't you try? Exactly. <laughs> so he actually and he said, yeah, do, try to do the same job as a minder, as a miner. Quote, stripped almost as naked as the day he was born. End quote. Saying it would be an experience that would quote trim some of the conservative notches off him. End quote. So again, he's fucking coming out of the gate. He is he is absolutely on fire, and he's challenging the current government to actually fucking do some stuff, you know, basically doing the hard graft. You know, go and go out and do what these fuckers are doing because I'll tell you what, you won't you won't last a fucking day. <laughs> you know, and and he's not wrong in that sense. Um I sure as shit couldn't be a coal miner for a day. <laughs> Fuck off. No way. So, I wouldn't I wouldn't even last like 4 hours. It wouldn't it wouldn't pan out. Absolutely. You know, he he you know, a very passionate and flamboyant speaker. You know, he's advocating for those workers' rights. You know, that's the kind of image you should be getting um, at this point. He's, he's, you know, he's not afraid to, to go out and basically give the middle finger to these governmental officials. Um, so I've actually, I've actually written here in my notes, Simple was not fucking around, which is <laughs> right. He was not fucking around. Um, so, and he was actually in um, a magazine called the Māori Land Worker, which is basically a working class paper or journal, 
and it said, quote, the rabid declamator using wild and whirling words and wind, and windmill gesticulations, end quote. So he was already quite known for you know, going out there and fucking, no one can see this, but I'm doing crazy hand movements. Um, <laughs> But you know he was already he was already well known for going out there and you know saying some you know pretty crazy shit um, in comparison to some other stuff that people were saying you know and getting out there with his with his hands and fucking making you know making his point and that kind of thing and basically they said he was adjusting to his new environment uh, but despite this uh, Semple was rejected at the polls in the 1919 election so he was actually kicked out of Parliament. Ooh. Upset. Absolute upset. Um, and oh. the thing about this Ooh. is he wouldn't return to national politics as a member for 10 years. Oh. So for the next decade, he doesn't come back to Parliament. Oh, tough luck, babe. That is, that is rough. <laughs> so instead, during this sort of 10-year interregnum, if you want to call it that, uh, he was part of various unions, uh, organising and advocating, uh, such as the National Freezing Workers Union. Uh, sorry, Fre- National Freezing Workers Federation, I should say. Uh, which I, I don't know if that translates well to other parts of the world, but a freezing worker in New Zealand is the guy, uh, you know, a lamb or a sheep comes in um, and you kill the sheep and you, you gut it and, you, you know, they, they basically make, they prepare all the meat and stuff for, you know, your sale um, in the supermarket. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, so that's what a freezing worker is. I don't know what you call them overseas. Like a butcher? Probably? No, not like a butcher. Like, it's a big factory. Oh. Um, yeah, so the sheep come, you know, uh, the, the big trucks come in with the sheep, and they, they kill the sheep, and then they gut them, and then pull them out, and then they do all that Yeah, there's stuff. definitely <laughs> a word for that, but I don't know what it is. So during this point, he's doing all bunch of stuff, and he was actually uh, part of the Wellington City Council, uh, for quite some time as well during this sort of 10 year interregnum. Um, and though he wasn't the center of New Zealand's labor movement anymore, he was still circling quite close to the nucleus. Um, for example, in 1925, he stood for parliament for Otaki, uh, which is a town just outside of, uh, kind of Wellington. Um, oh, sorry, I've actually written here a town about halfway between Palmerston North and Wellington. Um, so, yeah, I don't know how to explain where Palmerston North is, but That's it's okay. like, it's out there. <laughs> it's outside of Wellington. It's at the North Island. So, but he actually lost that, unfortunately. So he tried to get back into Parliament, and then he lost. Aww. So, whoops. And he was eventually elected president of the New Zealand Labour Party, now having reached its final form to the one we know today. So he was elected president of the Labour Party that exists today. Um, the one that is actually currently in power. So he was the president, not the prime minister. And what that means is not, sorry, not that he's the president. We don't have a president in New Zealand, but he was the president of the New Zealand oh, the, Labour Party. Of the party. Yeah. So he's the guy, you know, organizing the party, doing all that shit, whatever else. We don't have a president in New Zealand. We have a governor general who is the representative of the crown. So. You know, that's a weird thing if you're, like, American or whatever, if that matters. That makes so, sense. So in 1928, uh, he actually came back to Parliament and represented Wellington East. So before he was in Wellington South, now he's in Wellington East. Um, and that he actually represented that until 1946. Um, and then he Wait, represented... I'm sorry. Can you remind oh? me what year it started again that he was representing Wellington East? Uh, Wellington East, 1928. To 46? So he, rep- that's... he represented... Nearly well, 20 years. East for about, about 20 years. That's yep. good for him. Yeah, absolutely. Stable, stable job. Amazing. He did it. Yeah, absolutely. And then he represented Miramar, which is another electorate in Wellington, um, until he retired in 1954. From about 1928 until 1954, he is in Parliament. So he never leaves. Up until this point, despite his personality, he was on the margins of the party. By that, I mean he was not taking too much part in the construction of policy of the parliament. Uh, sorry, of, of the party. Um, so he wasn't, you know, he was, he was a flamboyant character. He was an interesting character. But when it came to the nitty gritty of actually doing the shit that parties should be doing, he wasn't really involved. He was a list MP. 
for anyone who knows what that means. Was he still um, president at the time, or no? Of the party? I don't believe so, no. Okay, so, so was, that's, was, uh, that's um, ended. So that's ended, but he's in parliament now, which is arguably more important, right? That's he's, where he wants to be. He's there, but he's like, but everyone else can sort the details out. I'm just here. That's all that really matters. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, additionally, up until this point, Labour had its own, um, th- they did have their own government, but they were only acting as either a coalition partner um, or as the opposition. Um, so sometimes they were part of, yeah, so for Americans, you don't really have this. But Yeah, I mean, I live in the UK, so I understand it, but for American listeners, explain it anyway. For American listeners, you need a majority in Parliament to basically do anything right you need 51 percent of parliament to agree to a law or to agree to a bill to make it a law but of course no one party is ever going to get 51 percent. that's just that just never happens yeah because so we we're up. we're doing the two-party system and other places think that's stupid but that means that you have to to make kind of alliances it's like, yeah, so, it's like a reality yeah. television show. You have to make alliances. A yeah, so you've got to join up. You know, you've got to team up with other parties so that, <laughs> yeah, you've got 40%, he's got 5%, you've got another one that's got five, you know, 6%. That equals 51%. Congratulations, <laughs> you have a majority. So it's all about getting that majority. So you have to make what's called a coalition. So they were coalition partners for quite some time, or they were um, the opposition uh, which is basically, it's technically uh, called, the leader of the opposition is called the leader of Her Majesty's Opposition, I believe is what it's called. So it's a very technical sort of title. It's a proper title, which basically means that you are the second largest party in Parliament. It basically means that you're not government, but the next step down, yeah, that's you. So that's <laughs> still a very important title. So for anyone, again, who's listening in uh, New Zealand, Simon Bridges is currently the leader of the opposition in New Zealand as of time of recording. Um, and this title, they had actually earned it in 1926, uh, the Labour Party. So the Labour Party had been growing and growing and growing. It started out as a very small party, and it had been growing growing and growing until the point in 1926 when they were officially given you know, the uh, opposition status, which is very, you know, very exciting for them. Um, but in nineteen thirty-five, so are they, are they the second? Are they the second largest party then? In this case, yes. Okay, so that's... they've risen from basically being a bunch of small unions combining their power and sure. then, you know, into a political party, yeah. and then rising through government until they've got enough MPs, enough votes, and stuff to basically be like, yes, we are the second yeah. largest party. Yeah, that's what I was going to say because I know that the, yep. the 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 opposition in the UK obviously is the second largest, so the one who only barely loses. Um, yeah. So I assume that had to be the same, but I just wanted to check because obviously yeah. I knew that they sort of have been on the move, but I didn't know if they'd amassed that much power at this point. So they have, which is yeah. cool. So it's exactly the same. In fact, I believe the current opposition in Britain is the Labour Party. Yeah, Jeremy Corbyn. I talked about the Labour Party. Yes. So, <laughs> yeah. So it's the, yeah, it's the same sort of thing. So, so yeah, so up until this point, they haven't been in government, or that they've been sort of on the sidelines of government a little bit. But in 1935, that would change under the famous leader of Michael Joseph Savage, uh, who, if you are even remotely familiar with New Zealand politics and New Zealand history, you should know who that is. Um, <laughs> The reason I'm laughing is because Caden is shaking her head like, I don't fucking know who that is. No. Who the, f- who the fuck is Michael Joseph Savage? No. Well, we'll talk about Michael Joseph Savage a little bit more. <laughs> but basically, Michael Joseph Savage becomes the Prime Minister, or the leader of New Zealand, um, in the first Labour government, uh, which is a very historic moment uh, in New Zealand politics. Basically, it's the first time that New- obviously Labour gets into government. It's the first time that kind of centre-left politics ends up, you know, getting into government, um, and that the unions are at the forefront of New Zealand politics. So it's a pretty fucking massive thing in New Zealand politics up until this point, you know. We've had the, I think it's the Reform Party is what it's called, uh, which is the, you know, kind of conservative, kind of centre-right 
party. We don't have, again, anyone who's listening, we don't have, you know, hard left or hard right parties. We have generally centre left, centre right parties. Yeah, someone um, tell any- America that. That's a great idea. Yeah, I was going to say, for anyone who is American, if you are on, you know, if you're looking at your politics, um, your politics are generally, if, if your politicians, when it comes to New Zealand, you, your politicians would be right and very hard right. Just so far to the right that they're almost not on the spectrum. For, uh, yeah, quite nearly. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's yeah. You're, yeah you're, our... you, know, you say Democrats are on the left, you're yeah. Democrats would still be on our right. Yeah, our <laughs> left is our left is the softest left and then our Republicans complain so much about them and they are the like the weakest, saddest attempt at being left that you could possibly have. Absolutely. I mean like I you know, I mean you guys fucking whinge about like, you know, universal health care and stuff and I'm like, I get sick, I go to the fucking doctor and he's like five bucks for all these pills and I'm like sweet ass bro like fucking hell you know it's so like I don't know what the fuck you guys are whinging about if I Such get like sick healthcare. I'm just gonna die right. yeah I mean like I don't know what I don't know what you people are whinging about it's either <laughs> like five bucks or I die like <laughs> I'd rather pay five bucks anyway so the Labour Party is now in power it's 1935 and, in fact, Bob Simple himself was one of the first people chosen by Michael Joseph Savage uh, for his cabinet. And in the case of Semple, uh, he was chosen for the Minister of Public Works. Uh, so by that, it is a ministry dedicated to major engineering projects such as dams. Um, and again, if you're in New Zealand, uh, one of these projects was the Clyde Dam down in Otago. Um, other things like military installations such as hangars and gun emplacements and railways. Um, so it's, you know, it's doing a whole bunch of, you know, different, different stuff, you know, kind of infrastructure type stuff and big major engineering project type stuff. So it's all sorts of different things that he's trying to build. And this was a pretty natural fit due to his background as he'd actually, um, worked with the Ministry of Public Works, uh, back in the day. So that, uh, railway that we talked about, you know, quite some time earlier, uh, that was actually headed by the Ministry of Public Works. Um, so he'd already worked with them before. He, at least from a you know a, a very low level perspective, kind of knew how they worked. So it was a pretty natural fit for him. And of course, being you know a coal miner and a union leader and that kind of stuff, you know, working with the you know the the, the kind of labour workers and that kind of stuff, this job was a very natural fit for him. So that's great. He's he's on the up and up still, which is awesome. Um, and he brought, uh, Simple brought all of his kind of fire and passion and wild zest uh, that he had during his time with the Red Feds, which was the uh, New Zealand Federation of Labour. Um, and he was actually once seen driving a Caterpillar tractor over a wheelbarrow and a shovel uh, to kind of tr- prove a point at one point. So, you know, there's that too. <laughs> And, and though he was a very much a, a kind of showman, um, his pragmatism, his drive, and very rural New Zealand attitude of let's get shit done uh, actually put him at the forefront of Labour's policies of trying to get the country back on track after the Great Depression. So, of course, by 1935, uh, or at 1935, you know, we've had the Roaring Twenties, and we've basically gone headlong uh, into the into into the great depression um you know or yeah everything about he's about he's trying to get us out of that great depression you know giving workers jobs doing more infrastructure projects all that kind of shit he's he's getting sucked into it and because and he's of that, kind of the perfect person because he's doing public work so that's the easiest way to kind of create jobs exactly absolutely so he's getting he's getting fucking stuck in you know <laughs> and that kind of thing so simple took his previous attitudes um, as well into his new role, which was, depending on how you look at it, was you know good or bad. Um, he was often generous to workers underneath him, um, but at the cost of overriding his higher officials, um, which was a bit of a you know bit of a problem again, uh, which some 
may have seen as too interventionist for a minister um, into his department. Generally in New Zealand, um, I don't know how it is in the rest of the world, but ministers generally don't get too involved with the nitty gritty details of how their ministry works. Um, you know, you shouldn't be going down like, yeah, you know, you, you know, you shouldn't be getting too much into what your um, your ministry is kind of how they're paying workers and this, that, and the next thing. And at least as far as I understand, that could be wrong. But yeah, generally you don't get too involved. The minister, the, the minister is generally a lot more high level. Sure. So people thought he was a bit too getting into it a bit too much. That's kind of just his way, though. I feel like he just cares yeah. more about the people than the politics of it all, despite the fact that he is a politician. Absolutely. So he's he's thinking... You know, I, I, I care about these workers. I know what these workers are thinking because I used to be one of them. So I know what they want and I know how I can help them, essentially. So that's kind of what's going through his mind uh, at the moment. So some things that he called cool that he did was he gave all workers um, standard rates of pay. So they all got the same pay. And you might think that that's pretty normal. But at this point... Uh, Māori, who we haven't actually spoken very much of at the moment, so Māori are the New Zealand indigenous population, so they were here before Europeans. Um, they were actually previously on lower rates of pay than their Pākehā counterparts. So Pākehā is the Te Reo Māori, or the Māori language version, uh, the Māori language uh, word for essentially white people, for Europe, New Zealand Europeans. So Māori were actually on lower rates of pay than, than you know, everyone else, basically. Um, but Bob Simple went, nah, you all got, you know, you're doing the same work, you all get the same pay. Which, you know. Radical. Good job. No one's ever thought of that before, which is depressing. Yeah, for a lot of people that was like, whoa, bro, bro, no, 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 no. We can't do that. We can't be paying those people the same as the other people. It's like, no. So Bob Simple was like, yeah, no, you're doing the same work, you get the same pay. Sweet as, which is pretty awesome. Um, And so... Because of all this kind of stuff, some professional staff, be it simple, would actually hand over power uh, in the department to the workers' committees. Um, you know, the, basically, he would hand over power to the unions. The unions would be able to, you know, go out and be like, hey, you know, we want this. And simple would be like, yeah, fuck yeah, we'll give it to you. No worries. Um, but they were eventually reassured um, through various concessions, um, which are not really important. But basically, the, the, the manage, it was basically the managers versus the workers. Uh, you know, the, the, the managers feared that the workers would be getting more and more power, but Simple was like, no, 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 we're going to give you some, some um, you know, concessions, make sure that you kept happy, pay rises, you know, various increases in power, that kind of stuff, just to make sure that, you know, you're not too fucking pissed off. <laughs> so, yeah, so he was, you know, he was, he was pretty good when it came to that, you know, he was trying to, trying to uh, increase, you know, the conditions and the pay of the people that he knew the best and the people that he was passionate about. Whilst also at the same time trying to keep his kind of high level officials and managerial staff, um, trying to keep them happy as well. So by all accounts, at least in my opinion, did pretty fucking well so far. Yeah, because that's, a, that's his... a kind of, you know, very difficult line to walk of trying not to piss off the people at the top who could pretty easily remove you from that, that position of power. Absolutely. Yeah. So he's trying to balance that line, you know, a little bit. So that was really good for him. So, of course, eventually, by you know, we're in the, the sort of late 1930s at this point, um, and a bit of a little thing called happened that was uh, World War II, um, a slightly insignificant thing uh, in the course of uh, politics in the world. You may have heard of it. You may have heard of it. Not sure if, <laughs> if you know, it's a big thing. I but, mean, to uh, be honest, in the world today, with how little some people seem to know about history, you only may have heard of it, and that's not sarcasm. <laughs> You may have only heard of World War Two and the Romans, and everything else may not have existed. I hope all. you've heard of it. I hope you've heard of it. Yeah. So, of course, our World War Two has a, a huge amount of ramifications, and they actually saw severe change in Simple as a person, because um, although. Uh, he had always been somewhat of an authoritarian kind of person as his role in as Minister of Public Works. Uh, at this point, he dealt harshly with anyone in the Public Works Department that criticised the war effort, or even just the Labour Party itself. So, he starts cracking down 
on dissenters. Um, so this is kind of his kind of negative side, if you want to put it that way. This is when he starts kind of, you know, up until this point, I'd probably say I agree with most things that he's doing. At this point, I'm going, for, for you know, fucking hang on, bro. Like, you know, let's, let's, let's calm the he's, farm here. He's got to be pretty old now, too. Uh, yeah, by 1930s, he was born in 1973. 73, right? So he's 1883. about... 1883. Yeah, eight, sorry, 1873. <laughs> so he's about 60 years old at this point. Okay. Give or take. Yeah. So he's not, you know, he's he's not like a spring chick anymore. Absolutely not. Um, so he's still... Yeah, so he is, he's, get, he's getting a bit on. He's active, he but he's kind of getting into that, like, angry grandpa phase. Yeah, he's one of those old white guys that he you wish would just really, die. He doesn't really relate to the kids anymore. Exactly. <laughs> you know, he's he's like, "Hey, fellow kids, coming out with this like, skateboard or whatever." Or, I don't know. I don't know what 1930s kids used. I don't know, but yeah, you know, he's getting a bit on in years. And th- at this point, he's got his Hitler mustache as well, which I'll show you in a minute. Um. It. So. Yeah, so he's becoming a bit more authoritarian. And in 1940, he was made Minister of National Service. Now, this is interesting because this was one of a series of portfolios uh, created specifically due to the war to help share the load of the Minister of Defence. So the Minister of Defence typically in New Zealand has control of uh, you know, the, the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force. And the Air Force obviously being quite a... I don't know if the Air Force actually existed at this point. Um, it might have been just the Royal New Zealand... Uh, yeah, I don't know if we had an Air Force at this point. But basically, the the, the, the Minister of Defence controls, um, you know, obviously the New Zealand military. Yeah. Um, but during, you know, a war of global proportions, the Minister of Defence was a bit sort of out of his depth. When it came <laughs> to this kind of stuff. You, know, you can't quite get one man to do everything. So there's a whole bunch of um, different other portfolios or, or ministries that were made um some of them were like you know to do with like accounting and stuff some of them were to do with um supply and logistics but in the case of bob simple he got national service and national service unfortunately deals quite heavily with conscription which if you remember to earlier Is he was quite heavily against horridly ironic yeah to the point where he got arrested for not revealing the age of his son. So he's handed a portfolio that, in theory, he's quite heavily against. But Bob being the kind of guy that he is, he was the first one who pushed for conscription. He oh, was the first no. guy who went out. The, the actual quote is that he drew the first marble which I wasn't quite able to figure out what that means, but I take that to mean that he was the first guy who went out and said, we need conscription, which, yeah, was something many would take as a betrayal given his staunch opposition earlier in life. So this was one of kind of the key things that, yeah, he kind of turned around and kind of flip-flopped. As long as it's not his kids anymore, he's like, ah, they're too old, it's fine. The grandkids, maybe, but whatever. I got a lot of those. Yeah, as we'll kind of see, uh, (laughs) you know, in the future, it it may be because, um, it may be because he he saw the practicality of what conscription is, what it means, and what it, you know, the alternative of not conscription might mean, in the sense that New Zealand might actually have a big fucking problem with it so i've actually got some pictures of bob simple a bit older so at this point he's yeah probably roughly in his 60s so in that first picture he is um he's on the far so front row he's on the he's first one on the right and that second picture is obviously just just him so you said first one on the right yeah oh he is yeah, he's looking a little bit older, a little bit worse. A bit older. He's got a Hitler mustache. He's gotten some glasses. I like his last... yeah, his fly low glasses. He's kind of like um, a little bit slouched in his chair. He looks very relaxed. Yeah, so he's getting a bit on in years now. Um, so he's he's looking a bit bit more weary, if you want to call it that. You know, his ten years in part outside of parliament is uh, taking its toll. 
It's weird, but I think because his Hitler mustache isn't, like, black, it's sort of gray yeah. by this point, it's not so bad. Yeah, it's not... Yeah, that's what I thought. It's it's not too obvious, so it's not too bad, but it certainly was something when I realized, wait a minute, he's got a Hitler mustache. It's got a little, like, salt and pepper, like, dapper, older gentleman kind of vibe Absolutely. to it. He's Absolutely. He's a, he's a silver fox. Hitler just hasn't really... Like, he never got the chance to hit that level, which is, you know, for the best, but... Absolutely. But this is... Yeah, I don't, I don't hate this. I don't love it, but I don't hate it. Yeah, I definitely, if, if I was going to go gay, it'd definitely be for younger Bob than older Bob, right? Like... But, like, older, Bob, older Bob's, you know, he's not doing shabby. Yeah, he's doing all right, considering, you know, you, you know, if you consider that this guy was out on the house floor, you know, gesticulating, you know, yelling at people, saying all sorts of inflammatory shit. I mean, he's been, know. he's been doing the parliament thing since the 20s, like... Mm. You know, guys sort of... He's been busy. He's been busy. So he's actually looking not too bad um, <laughs> you know, for, for a guy his age. So um, okay, so he looks... You know, he's looking all right. Um, and again, for anyone listening, we'll put these pictures up in various places so you can you can see what he looked like so you don't... So we're not just fucking talking to nothing. Um, <laughs> but at this point, it was this time that Bobby Big Nut Simple built his magnum opus or at least in my opinion was his magnum opus uh which was the actual topic of what i wanted to talk about (laughs) so if we want to end it here we can end it here Uh, oh my gosh that's horrible All right, everyone, with that cliffhanger, that is the end of the first part of the episode. Um, The goal is to get the next part out pretty quickly because I want you to know um, why this topic was something that Thomas was so excited to do, and we really need to get into part two to um, discover what that is. So hopefully this will be out in just a few days, really. I don't want to put too much space between them. Um, In the meantime, if you want to follow me anywhere, um, you can find me on Twitter. It's at HappyHistoryPod. You can also find me on um, Instagram at HappyHourHistoryPod, Facebook, HappyHourHistoryPodcast, and my Gmail if you want to send me emails about uh, things that you would like me to cover or color comments or anything. You can find me there at um, happyhourhistorypod at gmail.com. And I would love to hear from you, so please feel free to reach out for any reason at all. Um, Even if it's just to tell me that I don't know how to pronounce Aotearoa. 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 If I just mumble it enough, maybe nobody will notice. I can't say it. Um, But it's been a delight, and um, Thomas and I will be back for part two, so we will see you then. I thoroughly smashed. <laughs> I can't even feel my face anymore. It's, <laughs> it's so early in the morning for you too. At least I get to go to sleep. It's after ten this. o'clock in the morning, <laughs> and I'm fucking wasted. <laughs> that is ending up in the episode. That's edited uh, straight in there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh yeah. no! Yeah, for anyone listening, Caden is like ten o'clock at night. I'm ten o'clock in the morning. I'm 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 fucking trolleyed. I'm smashed. I'm pissed. <laughs> this is this is how much I dedicate to history. I'm willing to get fucking absolutely wasted at ten o'clock in the morning. You've been a really good sport about it all. Um, I, I've been so excited for this all week. 